So the most amazing thing is I walk in today and I notice that my avatar looks exactly like Dr. Solomon. So I don't know how that possibly happened. Um, I'm going to be talking to you uh, just a couple of caveats before I start. Uh, the first is that what I am is a lifelong marketer and specifically a uh, branding expert. So I spend all of my time trying to get clients to figure out how to enhance the engagement or the relationship that people have with their brand. What I'm not is a market researcher, although I'm spending a considerable amount of my time lately talking to market researchers. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you about is this world we call the non-conscious. Um, the one downside of a Mac is that the remote doesn't work on it. So um, what we're talking to clients about is this notion of growth. So there are two really critical challenges that people are facing right now. One is, is posting the kind of growth that uh, is necessary uh, to really drive value in, the, in a company. And many, many clients are just not experiencing the level of growth that they'd like to be experiencing. The second is on the rare opportunity where we run into a client who says, oh, I'm doing just fine, um, is how do you insulate that growth? And unfortunately, we all live in a world right now where there are challenges to our growth platforms that we just can't control. The biggest is the economy, but there are competitive threats that we can't anticipate. And so what we're talking about is, are there opportunities for you to transform that growth and really have a much po more positive impact on it? Very simple tenant, um, and I'm going to try to prove it to you really quickly, is what we see affects what we do. And so my view of the world is uh, completely what drives the actions that I take. And so the dilemma is that where you look affects what you see. And we think that people are not looking deep enough uh, to really understand what's going on in the world. And so the place we would like people to look more um, is what we're calling the non-conscious. So um, in deference to Lindsay and his dad, uh, they, uh, Professor Zaltman published that about, I believe his number is 95, that 95% of the decision making uh, that we make as human beings happens at what we call a non-conscious level. We just backed off of that a little bit and, and we're using 85. The number doesn't matter. But if you don't believe me that the vast majority of the decisions you make as a human are really at a non-conscious level, let me just tell you two quick stories. The first is, is I am, my educational background is I went as an undergraduate to Carnegie Mellon and I went as a graduate to Chicago Booth uh, Graduate School. I am about as linear and analytic as, as our educational system is able to produce. So when I approach a problem, what I tend to do is look for lots of information and data, and I try to analyze that data every which way I can. But the irony is, in my 30 plus career, 30 year plus career, every big idea I've ever had has either happened in the shower or in my car. So it's not when I'm analyzing all this data. It's when I remove myself from the data and try to make some sense out of it where that synapse takes place. That's the non-conscious. Um, another uh, story that would embarrass my daughter if she was here is I have two daughters. Uh, both are now in institutions of higher learning, uh, which is to be read. It cost me $118,000 a year. Um, the, my older daughter uh, is currently a senior at Union College, which is in Schenectady. And if she was here and I put the mic in her hand and said, could you explain to these fine people why you chose Union? she would give you three incredibly compelling and articulate reasons why she chose that school. And all three are true. But having observed this decision as a somewhat impartial uh, observer, they have nothing to do with why she picked Union. The reason she picked Union is it happens to be a spectacular uh, campus, but the day she visited was the most beautiful day I've ever experienced. Secondly, the woman who gave her the tour of the campus and she connected much more deeply than she had with anybody else who had given her a tour. And the third is, is that as a complete coincidence, the day that we were on taking the campus tour, the university president walked by and said hello. 
which reinforced to her one of her important attributes, which was an, it was intimate and she would get to know everybody there. Now, ironically, it's four years later and she's never actually talked to the university president, but that's her, that doesn't have anything to do with the story. So there, again, is just a quick example of where the non-conscious uh, impressions and experiences were far more influential than, in my opinion, than the conscious ones and incremental to them. And I personally have a stake in this decision because the school I was pushing was considerably less expensive than the one she chose to go to. So really, what we want to do is help people better understand the non-conscious and a lot of the great speakers today are going to be talking about this topic. In that non-conscious are embedded a couple of things, and I've talked about uh, some of them. One is emotion. So we all talk about or hear about the importance of emotion and decision making and branding. That's embedded in the non-conscious. Um, another thing that's embedded there is instinct. So sometimes we are processed to be able to make some decisions rather quickly and rather instinctively, and that's in the non-conscious. And a very important element of the non-conscious is your personal history. So your experience, I started earlier by saying what you see is affects what you do. What you see is affected by what you've done. And so that's a big part of it. So what I'm spending all my time doing, and a lot of people in this room as well, is really trying to figure out how can we help clients, marketers, better understand the non-conscious so that they can leverage that for a competitive advantage. And the problem with uh, marketing research, at the risk of offending almost everybody in this room, is that we spend almost 100% of our time measuring the 15%. So I say to clients when I talk to them, how good do you think you are at insights and marketing research on a scale from 0 to 10? or 100. And let's say they give themselves 100. So then what I say is you are probably measuring somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of truth, which means that the vast majority of truth is not factoring into the decisions you're making. So a lot of us today are going to be talking to you about efforts we're making to help people tap into a much deeper and more comprehensive part of that truth and the increment provides you two benefits. One is it provides you a proprietary benefit because almost everybody in every industry is measuring exactly the same 15%. So how do you expect to have a competitive advantage if you're looking at exactly the same data that your competitor is looking at? And I'll give you a real world example that's based here. I was involved when uh, um, Yellow Transportation purchased Roadway, uh, which is an Akron based company. And these two companies were like Coke and Pepsi. They hated each other. Their primary sales pitch to customers was, we're better than Roadway or we're better than Yellow. And we took all of the data that each company had collected on customers and on each other for over 40 years. And for the first time, because it was during the uh, acquisition period, aggregated that data looking for new insights. And uh, it was the worst day of my career when the output came out and imagine a graph that says, here are the meaningful differences between you and yellow based on the data you've been connect collecting on each other. There was a blank page. They had exactly the same data about each other over 40 years of time. So how does yellow get an advantage over roadway by looking at exactly the same data? So the first advantage is proprietary. And the second advantage, which gets me a lot more excited, is provocative is the purpose of insight is to stimulate new thinking which will stimulate new behavior. And, um, and if you're looking at the same stuff over and over again, how's that going to drive brilliant new thinking? Um, I was going to use the slide later, but I say a lot of the work we do is to, and, and this is in homage, but also I say this not only two days after he died, is to, it is Steve Jobs for the rest of us. So if you think about the two things that made Steve Jobs remarkable, the first was instinct. The man built products that got him excited. And it turned out that that metric uh, developed a lot of very, very cool products. And most of us are not blessed with that level of instinct that we can come up with those kinds of breakthroughs as consistently as he did. 